I'm Diego Cordovez with Adam Schoenfeld. Welcome to The Scoop, brought to you by Phil Tilt Poker. Uh, HBO recently had a series, John Adams. Today we have Brandon Adams. And, uh, That's eerie. <laughs> ironically. So um, he's actually uh, cashed quite a bit at the World Series the last couple of years, but he's really made his name in the cash games. He's a high cash game player. I was playing at the Bladger last year, and I look over, and here's this you know, relatively new figure on the poker scene, you know, fresh-faced youngster, and uh, he had, you know, tons of cash playing these big guys, big games. Unlike many of our colleagues, he's also read books and has attended Harvard. I mean, yeah, he's like a uh, PhD student at, uh, at Harvard and, uh, you know, has actually had a real life and success in life, so uh, Should be interesting, interesting guy to talk to. So you've made your mark the World Series with a bunch of caches and a deep run in the main event, but I think you're still better known for your cash game play, and that's where you really kind of uh, um, let the world know that you'd arrived. And I remember just hearing about your big match against Sammy Farha. I think that's when most people first heard about you, where you played uh, heads up against Sammy Farha in Pot Limit Omaha. And crazily enough, he gave you a he gave you a spot where you would have the button every single hand. Yeah, that was a great week for me. That was a great month. That was my best month ever in gambling. Um, what happened that week, uh, they filmed High Stakes Poker Season 4. Right. And that was the first year, I guess the only year, where they did the really big game. They did the, uh, the what was the what was the game? Uh, oh, 4, the game with Guy and, and Sammy where they played, uh, I guess, was it 500, 1,000? I suppose it was. Yeah, the, the, the bigger version of high stakes poker. Okay. Um, so I played that year in high stakes poker, I guess, the first day, mm-hmm. and then I was an alternate for the, for the big day, uh, day right. three. And uh, Sammy lost a decent bit in, those, in two of those sessions. I think he played uh, the first day and then the third day in the big game. And uh, the week after that, for some reason, there were a lot of big games going. And we were playing at the Venetian every day, and we were playing like 100-200, and there were games going at the Bellagio and stuff like that. And one day I was playing at the, at the Venetian, and... Uh, and I remember I was, like, incredibly tired when I got there, but I had committed to play. Mm-hmm. And sort of the minimum commitment was around 3 to 12 because we had to get a game going and stuff. So right. I, I kind of felt like I had to be there from 3 to 12. So I got there at 3, and uh, I remember I was down, like, 50000 or whatever, and I just was having a kind of a bad session overall. And... Right at about 11, I ordered dinner and a uh, half bottle of wine. And my plan was just, all right, You're I'm, I'm going to st- stick with the plan. <laughs> I'm going I'm to have, have a nice dinner, have a couple glasses of wine. And at midnight, I'm out of here. Right. And shutting down the session, stuff like that. Good so, plan. Yeah. Yeah. And I had, I had, like, just finished the wine. Just finished the dinner and the wine. And Sammy came in, and he really wanted to play. And he was like... He was like, "Let's kick it up. Let's play. Let's play PLO." Right. And then the, there was some talk of playing half and half, and that might have happened, but that didn't happen. And Sammy's, so, Sammy's reputation has been built on PLO. They, a lot of times, people make him play the other games if he wants to play PLO. You know, uh, yeah. because he's weaker in the other games. But Pablo in Omaha really is where he uh, he's yeah. always built his reputation. And at that point, he had already written his book, which which, which came out I, I don't know sometime in the last year. And uh, in the book, he has a chapter about playing PLO heads up where he spots the button. Because he's, <laughs> he's done it successfully in, in the past against good players. Mm-hmm. Uh, See, that's surprising already. And me. the strategy that he writes about in the book is basically just putting in as much money in, into the pot on the early streets, like on the, uh, before the flop and on the flop, to steal it back later. Right. Which, you know, against, against a good player, like, you're just never going to win spotting the button. But... Um, Anyway, he came in and they, he he couldn't agree on on changing the game. There was no agreement on changing the game, so he was like, "All right, I want to play someone heads up, a hundred hundred k freeze out." And no one was quick to take up that offer, you know, no half and half or anything like that. So then he was like, "Okay, a hundred k freeze out, three six. I spot the button, and I was like, I was thinking about that. And there wasn't a line for that. Well, as soon as he said it, I was like, "All right, I'll do it." So instantly, yeah, I was like, uh, I was really in bad shape, but I said, "All right, I'll do it." 
So uh, I just went and sort of cleared my box. I don't know, I had like 150 left in the box or something. Cleared the box, and, and we started playing. And uh, I don't know, I think things went pretty well like right from the start. Mm-hmm. And uh, Evidently. Yeah. <laughs> and I won... Um, well, some people in that Venetian game took a piece of me, so it said I had like 30% out. But then they they closed out like when their game broke. So uh, I was only up like 100 at that point. And then I ended the night up, I don't know, like 300 and something. Mm-hmm. And then we continued the game... I think the first day I was up like 350 or something. And then, we, and then we continued the game two days later at the Bellagio. And there were a bunch of weird conditions for, for, for continuing the game. <laughs> the, 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 basically, the, the conditions, if I remember correctly, were that I was to start with 350 in front of me and he was to start with 40. And we were to play like a straight-up game of PLO where the, where the button didn't rotate. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sorry, where the button did rotate. Right. And then if I won that, then we were to revert back to 100K freeze outs where I got the I got the button every hand. Did you have to have attorneys to do these negotiations? <laughs> it was a really weird negotiation, but, <laughs> but I don't know. We negotiated it and... Uh, I can't even understand the logic, but... There, there was no you know, real logic to it. At that point, you were willing to yeah. do whatever was reasonable to keep it going, I guess. So... Um, you know, then I won again that day, and uh, that was it. And that set off. That was a really good month. Then there was I won no like more. every session. He decided that no month. more at that point. Yeah, and and then uh, then like in June of the last year, we started um, playing the big no limit PLO game, and that started because Brian Townsend and I went to dinner one night. And he, I kind of said that I was done playing against Sammy because Sammy didn't didn't want to do any spots anymore, and I didn't really want to play that big without a spot. And so mm-hmm. Brian was like, "Well, I'll play him." So Brian set up a head, heads up match against him, and they played in in early June, right during the World Series. It was good. yeah, and they had some huge swings. I can't yeah. even remember how it turned out. I think Brian beat him up pretty good, but. Uh, this is when Sammy objected to Brian posting the results online. Do you recall mm, that? No, I think this was earlier. Okay. This was like right around June 1st. They were playing half PLO, half Hold'em, I think. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think I we, think Brian won a good bit. Swings, yeah. um, and, I mean, you can't even compare last year to this year in terms of action. I mean, this year there's no action. There's none, right? There's right. nothing going on. Last year, I remember when Sammy and Brian were playing that game, we were playing a big 100, 200, no limit game with big annies, you know, 500 or 800, right at the next table. And then there were, there were other two, sometimes three other big no limit games going on in the main poker room. And then you would also have like 400, 800 stud going every right. day. It was crazy. You had, you had mixed games going. You had uh, 25, 50 no limits and all of that stuff. This year, there's just no comparison. There's very. What do you think the... I think the next week, I, I suspect you might have a kick up in like 100, 200, 200, 400 no limit. Is there some starting, kind of starting problem that's caused the big games to dry up? Or do you think it's just... Just people going broke, you know, and the game's getting tougher. I mean, you can see it in all the tournaments right now. The, the players are just much tougher. The fields are much tougher. And, and to some extent, a lot of bigger games have moved to the Internet. I mean, they existed before, but I think people were still getting comfortable with the idea of playing for big money on the Internet. Mm-hmm. And it's not... I mean, there's, like there's a drop-off overall, I agree. But I also think that some of the live games and the players who kind of kept those live games going have uh, transferred over to the Internet, and they're playing... There are a lot more big games going on. Well, those seem to have dried up to a Yeah, those, those look to be drying up a lot, yeah. too. I, yeah. I'll see one guy sitting at like six tables, and then another guy sitting at the same limit six tables. But they don't want to play each other. Yeah, but they're waiting for someone else. And then if, the, if that right. someone, whoever it is, doesn't show, there's no game. I, yeah. uh, you know, we were shooting at Bellagio the show last year, and I was playing down in the poker room, and you know, between uh, interviews and stuff like that, and yeah, the whole place would be full, and Bobby's room would just be uh, 
be rolling, you know, 24 hours a day. Yeah, this That's year everyone, all the same people are just playing golf and just right. hanging out. There's good golf these tournaments working on their, and stuff. Working on their 10. That's when yeah. I came in and people had told me that, uh, you know, you'd won almost a million dollars in this match against uh, Sammy, you don't mind me saying. And then, like you say, right after that, the action got even bigger. Yeah, uh, well, so the, the evolution of the action from there was uh, you had the heads-up game with Sammy, and then I remember one day I came back I was staying at the Venetian last summer. I came back to my hotel room, and I went on two plus two, and there were these, there were these threads about Brian having Sammy stuck like 1.3 million, and David Benjamin had just joined the game. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, I was like, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go play in that game. Yeah. And so I went over there and played in that game, and I and I I won. I had a great session that day. Uh, and that was five hundred a thousand, the ante. So that was like the first, the first incarnation of that really big mixed game happened in early June, and that went for a, just about four days. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second incarnation of that big game was the week before the the series, the main event. Um, I. You know, I was running good last summer, so I wasn't into game selection so much. And I was just in in walking around the poker room. Bobby Baldwin was in there, and he really wanted to start a game. So I was like, all right, you know, I'll start a game with you. We'll play heads up 300, 600, half and half. So we, we started that game, and I just ran. I remember I ran ridiculously good that day. Um, and that, that game filled up. And became really a legendary game that had 15 players come in and out. It kicked up at one point to 500, 1,000. And you had... Uh, right. For no yeah, limit, this, not limit blinds. Yeah, this was the day that uh, Zygmunt on full tilt, Olari, who at that time was 22 or something like this, he came in and sat in the game, had probably 30 drinks, like 30 <laughs> vodka drinks. Uh that would kill me. This is one where I read where he was giving people some beats that probably really stole. Oh the yeah, he gave further. Kenny, <laughs> he gave Kenny a, like a runner runner beat and just tried to just completely give his money to Kenny and and, and put a runner runner gut you know, Kenny trade Tran. on on Kenny Tran, and then uh, there were that that was just a crazy That's night. Good for like the game. <laughs> like N Nanad Medic came came in the game, and you know Nanad's a very rational poker player, and he just got to Bobby's room. And he was like really, really drunk as well. But he looked at this game and he was like, he was like, I just can't not play. Like I just have right. to sit in. You know, this is this is insane. So so he he sat in and uh, it was a full full game all night. And I remember I was up that day. I was up like five hundred and. I have like six fifty thousand. Six. I have like six six fifty in front of me, and and three people had me covered, including Olari and Brian Townsend. And I was tired. and I was like, all right, I'm just going to book this win and get up. The I I proceeded to lose that money that I was up the five hundred over the next week because that that game that started at three hundred six hundred evolved it into the the 1K, 2K game. And that game actually ran, the 300-600 game ran continuously for about 11 days. Hmm. And what happened was when Bobby left the first night, he was really into the idea of, hey, we, we might be able to have a game going all week. So he was like, all right, the people who started this game, which was me, Kenny, David Kim, uh... David Benjamin, Brian Townsend, Bobby, there was like, all right, let's just show up at 7 and start the game again the next day. And so that was a success. Showed up at 7, started the game the next day, and it went like that for for a long time. And then uh, the whole week, that Monday through Friday, it was 500, 1,000. Then Guy came in the game on Saturday, kicked it up to 1K, 2K. Then at one point, the game splintered off such that there was additionally another game that Doyle started that was that was the big version of the big game, which mm -hmm. which is four thousand, eight thousand right. stud with one thousand ante, four thousand, eight thousand limit hold'em, 
one K two K PLL hundred K cap and one K two K no limit with one K Annie. It's right. a big game. These are the <laughs> well, two biggest games in history, and they're side by side. Yeah, really. Uh, you know, I was thinking that this was the biggest game in history, but I was playing next to Doyle yesterday, and he told me that that they were actually playing one K two K in the seventies. <laughs> yeah. Which is pretty insane. In the seventies. What's that in real dollar terms? That's got to be at least uh, one. It should point. be. Uh, <laughs> it should be eight times. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you say like seven percent inflation, like from yeah. the mid seventies, that should be eight times the money. So they were playing with like. He, he said they were, they were playing with like you know, like drug dealers and so forth. Right. One K two K. That's crazy. Um, now so you you really, I mean, uh, just burst on the scene. I mean. Uh, all of a sudden, people started hearing about you playing yeah, where you winning of these big games. So, did you just uh, arrive in Las Vegas and start playing in these gigantic games, or what was the the build up or the lead up to this? Pokemon well, Lies? I've been playing online since 2002, and then you know, I've been traveling around playing tournaments and big live games since around you know 2003 or so. Mm-hmm. And then the the big live game phenomenon in Las Vegas, like in terms of having big live games that are good. Right. Somewhat easy games. That's a somewhat new phenomenon, and I really think a lot started back um, this sort of silly TV show that they filmed at Binion's, the Cash Poker hmm. TV, which was which was an offshoot of high stakes poker. Mm-hmm. I feel like that started a lot of action because what happened is um, they got that game together once a month. Filmed it for TV. I played in every one of those, and they were really, really good games. Mm-hmm. 75, 150, 25, any that would often have a mandatory straddle, and, right. then, and then get bigger. Once the filming stopped, they would get bigger, and you'd have usually swings of a hundred thousand per player. Yeah, that, that, that game, show was. It's not even that well known. I saw it on YouTube. Yeah, but it, it would be funny if that was the catalyst for a lot of. Yeah, it was the catalyst because what happened is that started in in August of 2006, mm. and um, I've I've flown for all those, and they would have two tables for e- for each of those. Then Gabe Thaler got the idea to to just do that a similar thing every week in Las Vegas. So he said, "All right." I'm going to have a game every Wednesday and Friday at the Venetian. It's going to start at 7 p.m. Depending on how many players are in town, it's either going to be 25-50 or it's going to be 50-100. So mm-hmm. Some weeks it will even be 100-200. It tended towards the, the higher. I mean, it quickly became a standard of 100-200 with an ante and so forth. So, so uh, he, Gabe started his game. He was able to recruit weak players, and it... <laughs> It kept the game healthy. Um, See, that's very interesting to me in the sense that Gabe is a very, very good player, mm-hmm. very solid player, and uh, you know, to build a game, I mean, that takes some talent because it's a whole separate talent. <laughs> I mean, uh, I can see where you're if you're a very live, loose player, or you know, if you're uh, you know someone who's not a professional and you build a game, but for a professional player who's known as a winning, solid player. To literally build a game from scratch takes a lot of uh, moxie. You know, it really, yeah, it really just takes some organization. Like people, you know, David Gray told me one time, he was like, there are a lot of guys out there who just want to gamble. You just have to give them, you just have to give them a reason and a time. Right. That's all they need. Like, you know, but you just gonna attract the guys who are going to organize, call everyone up, make sure they right. show up. Yeah, I couldn't like, do that. You, you don't have logistics. to. Like, like the the pro doesn't have to give the weaker player like a spot or anything like right. that. A lot, a lot of times, the weaker player just wants to gamble and he just wants a place and a time. If you give him a spot, it might be taken as an insult. Yeah, uh, if you just, but the, yeah, that, I can see that. So, so Gabe. Gave everyone a place and time in Las Vegas. He said, "We're going to play Wednesday and Fridays at the Venetian. If you're interested, if you're if you're a strong player and you're interested, write me. I'll try to find a seat for you. <laughs> you know, if you tell me you're going to show up and you don't show up, you'll never you'll never play in the game again. Right. If you're a weak player, well, I'll probably try to contact you. And he successfully yeah, built the game. If you're a weak player <laughs> and you don't show up, it's okay. Yeah, 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 right. Right. Yeah. 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 If, exactly. if you're a weak player, I'll, I'll reserve your preferred seat. Yeah, correct. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Club seating. So um, that that game started a, a lot of big Vegas action. Fantastic. Game the the LA games 
they've, you've had big private games in LA for a long time. The action at Commerce yeah. has been pretty good for a while. Kenny's successfully had had some good games. So there there was like just a a peak of these no limit games, like starting in late 2006. Really, 2007, you know, will be seen as like the peak of these yeah. of these big no limit and Omaha games and stuff like this. Um, and it was really a weird phenomenon where you had some very weak players. Hmm. Um, well, as you say, inevitably the history of no limit hold'em is that the weak players can't survive for long. Yeah. <laughs> you know, limit or pot limit action. Yeah. I know. Um, We've got other stuff we all need to, to go with. But one thing, you mentioned the high-stakes poker. You were on for a couple of days. And having played with you, I really thought it was a disservice to you that you were on and, uh, you know, they kept referring to you as the professor <laughs> and uh, saying, you know, you were this very tight kind of nitty player and you didn't get into a lot of hands, which is not really representative of your, yeah. your style of play. Well, fortunately, in, in January they did the... Uh, the did the Aussie Millions cash game, and I had a, a lot of really interesting hands there. So that was like that was like what high stakes poker should have been. I lost it. I lost in Aussie Millions. I lost like a hundred thousand, but it was. But you were playing. There was a lot of interesting play. I was involved in a lot of tight situations. Um, so that was what I wanted high stakes poker to be. Uh, but in high stakes poker, I, I just didn't have many interesting situations come up and I had one like I, there was one big bluff that I ran on on Eli that they just didn't show for one reason or another mm-hmm. maybe because they filmed through the tape changes and stuff like right. that just to keep the momentum of the game so probably during a tape, tape change or so was the one time I I had a big all-in bluff and they didn't show it um so you know I uh and there was another time where there was a three-way hand me Sammy and Eli and and I uh Bluffed on the turn was uh, Eli called me and then I he checked me on the river. I gave up. And they didn't show that hand either. But um, yeah, that was just in in high stakes poker. You're you're only playing like ten hands or or fifteen hands per hour. And, and right. in my case, I was in for a half a session, which was like five hours. You know, you don't have that many uh, hands. Uh, and you want to play a, a few more hands because it's TV and like you want to mix it up and be in the action. But at 300, 600, 100 hand, you don't want to take it out, yeah. take it too out of control. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So you, you want to play a few hands and mix it up for TV, but you don't you don't want to go crazy with Sam once you're left. You can't take it to an extreme either. Yeah. Well, World Series is underway. I know you want to make your mark uh, here. You've had six or seven caches the last couple of years and a deep run in the main event. So uh, we'll let you go, but thanks for joining us on The Scoop, and uh, we'll look for you in the, in the big events and hopefully win a bracelet. Of course. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, thanks for Brandon. It. Thanks for joining us on The Scoop, brought to you by Full Tilt Poker. Write us at thescoop at carplayer.com with suggestions for guests, questions for them. Thanks for joining us. Chips are everything. Tools used to bully, trap, or bluff, simultaneously staging battles and keeping score. Their strength is in numbers, capable of intimidating or driving a player to desperation. And in the end, all that matters is that they're in your stack. We play at FullTiltPoker.com.